Super awesome. Okay, this is the non, this is the, <clears throat> the Poisson-Boltzmann equation. Sometimes it's called the nonlinear Poisson-Boltzmann equation, and that's just to distinguish it from simplified forms where people have linearized the right-hand side, and that's something that we're going to do during this lecture. Okay, so when I look at this, it doesn't make much sense to me. There are lots of symbols. I don't quite know what to do with sums. I'm used to looking at partial differential equations. I'm not used to looking at sums. And so there's just a lot of stuff going on. And we can put this in a much simpler form if we non-dimensionalize it. And so that's something that we're going to do immediately. I want to compare and contrast the way we non-dimensionalize the, the Poisson-Boltzmann equation to the way we non-dimensionalize the Navier-Stokes equations and the scalar advection diffusion equation. So if you take Navier-Stokes, Navier-Stokes, at least for steady boundary conditions, has four different parameters. It has two parameters from the governing equations. And it has two parameters that come from the boundary conditions. So there are four parameters. The buckingham pi theorem says that anytime we seek to non-dimensionalize something, we take the number of parameters we have and we subtract away the number of units that are relevant to, this, uh, to the case. In this case, we have mass, length, and time. So we have three different units being described by four parameters. And that means that we can make four minus three or one non-dimensional parameter. And that non-dimensional parameter is the Reynolds number. If I look at the passive scalar advection diffusion equation, I go through a similar process, and I end up with a Peclet number. That's equal to UL over D. When I look at the Poisson-Boltzmann equation, there's a key thing that's going to be different. And what's different about the Poisson-Boltzmann equation is that I have a governing equation with a whole bunch of terms, or a whole bunch of parameters. I have ci, zi, epsilon, r, t, what else have I missed? Epsilon, r, t, there's f. Oh, let's see. Well, that's a good, uh, that's a good place to start. I have a whole bunch of stuff here. From the, from the boundary conditions, I have a, the phi naught, or the phi at the wall. I have a characteristic length. And I have all the values of the concentrations at infinity. The key thing that is different about the Poisson-Boltzmann equation, at least uh, the thing that I think is key, and what really makes me think about the way we non-dimensionalize the Poisson-Boltzmann equation differently is that I can go and find my key non-dimensional parameters without invoking the values at the boundaries. And what that means is that the natural quantities that are going to come out of non-dimensionalize the Poisson-Boltzmann equation are not so much going to be the non-dimensional parameters that relate to the boundary conditions, but in fact, two key dimensional parameters that relate to the governing equation itself. And so the first thing we'll do with this Poisson-Boltzmann equation is we'll non-dimensionalize it, and we'll find that we can non-dimensionalize it without ever talking about the boundary conditions, without doing anything with phi naught, without doing anything with L. Okay, so first things first. I have an argument of the exponential function. So my exponential function is minus zi times f times phi over rt. And the argument of the exponential function must be dimensionless. And that makes me immediately realize that a key non-dimensional quantity must be sitting inside the argument of the exponential function. And specifically, that parameter is the thermal voltage RT over F. (laughs) 
So I just get this by taking the universal molar gas constant times 298 Kelvin divided by the Faraday constant, and I get about 25 millivolts. Right? What that tells me is that when I think about the way charge is oriented in a system, when I look at the distribution of some ionic species, C sub i, I immediately know whether it's going to be affected by potential changes by looking at the local potential and comparing that to 25 millivolts. If I told you that I had a wall and the surface charge was 1 millivolt, you should immediately think, OK, the ions are not really going to react very much to that. It's going to be a small perturbation. Yes, ions will orient themselves, but it's going to be a small perturbation. It's going to be a linear, perti linear perturbation. It's going to be a minor thing. If I tell you that I have a surface that has a charge of 1 volt, you should immediately be thinking, OK, that is 40 times bigger than this. That means that the concentration of those ions is going to be changed by e to the 40th from the bulk concentration. Right? So if I take a 9 volt battery and I connect a wire to it, or two wires to it, and I stick those in an electrolyte solution, you should be asking yourself, what is going on with those ions? Because the concentration of those ions on the wall, as predicted by this, are e to the 300 and 60, 40, 60, e to the 360 changed. Right? Now that's big enough that, of course, all of these equations have broken down. Right? But if I connect a 9 volt battery to an electrolyte solution, I am making a huge perturbation on the system. 1 millivolt, relatively small. And I know that immediately from calculating this thermal voltage. OK. So if I do that, if I now say, all right, well, I'm going to define phi star is given by phi over this RT over F. I can now rewrite this equation. So I took an RT over F. The RT came here, and an F came on top. There also is an F in this summation up here all the way on the top on the right. And I pulled that out as well, and that's why I have F squared here. So my, my equation is getting simpler. The next thing I want to do is I want to non-dimensionalize these concentrations. These C sub i, right now these are in moles per liter, and I want to non-dimensionalize those. And I'm going to non-dimensionalize this by the ionic strength of the medium. And this ionic strength is very common in chemistry. It's basically a way to measure locally how well these ions are, uh, different ions shield each other in solution. We'll find that this ionic strength will immediately become relevant in our understanding of the electrical double layer because this ionic strength is going to be part of the definition of the Debye length. It's going to be part of the description of over what distance these ions shield this wall. When I do that, I can now replace these ci infinities with ci star infinities times this ionic strength. And I can pull that ionic strength out. When I do that, oh wait, sorry, I made a mistake. The correct definition has a 1 half in the front. Okay, so all I'm doing is I'm moving around symbols and this and that. But I've gotten to an important point. 
I did one important non-dimensionalization, which is that I non-dimensionalized the voltage by RT over F, and I did that at the beginning because I could see that from the argument of the exponential. But now, I'm in a position where both of the sides of these equations now have units of 1 over meters squared. I have a non-dimensional property here, but I'm taking a second derivative with respect to length. This stuff is all, sorry, this stuff is all non-dimensional because there's a star there, and sorry, there should be a star here. <coughs> so this is non-dimensional, 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 non-dimensional. I have a whole bunch of goop here. If you work it out, you'll find that this has units of 1 over meters squared. Again, this is a second derivative with respect to length, and so this has units of 1 over meters squared. So now I have to ask myself, I need to characterize this system by a, a characteristic length. I could use some length from the boundary condition, but if I just define a characteristic length equal to the square root of the reciprocal of this, then my life gets really easy really fast. So I'm going to define the Debye length, lambda d, as the square root of epsilon rt over 2 times the Faraday constant squared times the ionic strength. And to be precise, this value will always be evaluated in the bulk. And so I should be a little bit more precise here. When I say that the ionic strength is given by this expression, I'm referring specifically to the concentrations of these species in the bulk. So when I define this as my characteristic length, now I can define a non-dimensional Laplacian. Rather than taking derivatives with respect to x, y, and z, I'm going to take derivatives with respect to x star, y star, and z star where those length scales are all normalized by lambda d. By the way, I just want to report to you. I don't know how you guys are all doing like in terms of the lecture, but I think I actually just like blew out my rotator cuff. So if you find me randomly changing to writing left-handed, please don't be mad at me. But my left my right arm just stopped working. I noticed that this is something that started happening to me when I was 33 something to look forward to. Is there anyone here who's uh, also finding that their arm stops working in the middle of lecture? Okay, everyone's good. Okay. I'm sure it'll be fine. All right. So now, <clears throat> I'm going to say, all right, <clears throat> del, uh, del star squared is equal to the regular Laplacian, but multiplied by lambda d squared. When I make that substitution, basically all of the pre-multiplying factors go away, and I am left with a simpler version of this expression. Do 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 ba ba dee do do star, and then I put a thing here, and this has a star. So this is now my non-dimensional form of the nonlinear Poisson-Boltzmann equation. So now we've gotten rid of a bunch of the details, and we know that when we now we see that when we non-dimensionalize this properly, we basically have a non-dimensional Laplacian of a potential. And that is basically just given by a sum of some concentration of species with their valence and an exponential correction factor 
to account for the fact that at any position in space, the amount of, say, sodium ions versus chloride ions is affected by the local potential.